as a kid, I was so afraid of the stage and so afraid of talking to people and getting up there in front of the class for a book report or something. I hated it. I never thought that my life would revolve around being in front of people all the time. <laughs> Twin Cities, make some noise for Tim Atlas! My name is Dim Atlas. I make music, I make art. I dance, I sing, I rap, I write poetry. I would describe my music as an eclectic bunch of things that, that I'd like to listen to. I mean, grunge, alternative, hip hop, funk, soul, electronic. I used to go on this train all the time when I was living down in St. Paul. I'm always gone and I'm, I'm probably used to just touring by now. We are always on the move. So when I'm back home, it's very hard for me to sit still. I get really antsy and I just, I go out. I was born in Akron, Ohio. And when I was about three, I moved to North Minneapolis, Minnesota. I've been here ever since. Nothing pacifies, can the life pass me by? No more crying, no more tears, no more dying. Touring to all of these places, I realized how how beautiful it is here. Like I love the Twin Cities. Like I love being from here. It's a hidden gem. My earliest memories was listening to Prince. I was like three or four years old, and we used to go on um, road trips a lot. And I just remember hearing Little Red Corvette and I Would Die for You and Purple Rain and Let's Go Crazy. Those are some of my earliest memories. Just digging deep at the cats that came before me. So much rich culture here musically, and it still continues to this day. My writing process is pretty simple. I hear something in my head and I just go with that. Um, usually, I think I do the best writing when it's, when it's um, instigated by like a strong emotion. Like how you feel when you've been rejected or uh, anger or a, a deep sadness or even joy, you know? And that's usually like the, uh, the spark for me is a strong emotion. Mostly stories, mostly just emotional thoughts. And sometimes it'll just be a collage. Like a painting. Some of the abstract painters, you know, like neo-expressionists, you stare at a painting and you can't, what is it, what does it mean? Who knows? How does it make you feel? What am I looking for in a tavern darker than a cavern? Why does it never stop? All the screaming cries from high up on the rooftop. I love looking and studying other artists' work. Sculptures, uh, I'm particularly fond of uh, paintings. When I visit museums, I'll, I'll study these, these artists' paintings and their works, and I'll hear a song. I'm moved by them. There's a quiet restlessness going on in my mind. That moment of reflection that you get when you stare deeply into a painting and you just feel it, and you're just, you're just immersed in it. And that's what, I, that's what I aim to create myself, so. Seeing this, just a reminder, you know? Yeah, it's crazy, like even, even now, in this space, I feel very much at home. When I don't know where to go, I'll go to a dive bar, usually by myself. Sometimes I'll be fortunate enough to run into people that, that I know. Other times I think it's unfortunate to run into people that I know. <laughs> you're the most beautiful girl, I know you hear it all the time. I don't know what else to say as you roll your eyes. 
I love this place. Just the history, you, you step in here and you can tell it's been lived in. Even when I'm touring, I like to find out where the, the dive bars are because they have an energy to them. They're not well put together, they're just themselves. And you can be yourself as well. They're not, it's not clean, it's not, it's just grimy, it's real. Not just dive bars, I, I really enjoy being in places with music or loud music or atmosphere. People talking, chattering, that hum of, of people just together, you know? I performed at this bar when I was first starting out. I was on that stage right over there and I actually hopped on the, the bar table and started rapping and singing. It was great. It was, it was a legendary night. <laughs> I would describe a Dem Atlas show as raw energy, powerful, passionate, real, authentic. Just getting lost and then getting found. Man, before a show, every show, I feel uh, nerves, the, the butterflies in the stomach, and that's how I know that I'm, I'm present. And I'm just, it's just my body's way of knowing that I'm preparing to do something, you know? I give it everything I got. Twin Cities, make some noise for Tim Atlas! Minnesota, put him up, put him up, ah! Who put the bad mouth on me, run from me, I'll be sitting on the corner, watch the world go by. I'm halfway finished with my life sentence. Not looking for repentance, just looking for some escapism. We are at the Palace Theater. Hometown shows are different. It's nice to play off of that extra energy and feed off of that. I don't know what you could say. To make me wanna get up and start my days. Put everything I had into the wrong place. Gave it all away, so I gotta walk away. The last song is called Gratitude. I like to do, I like to close out that song every night. Sometimes I feel like throughout some songs I perform them a certain way and I put on this face and, and this mask, but that song especially is, is the song that I can take off the mask and I can just let it all hang out. I like performing because I really feel like I'm purging something. I'm getting rid of something. I'm not thinking, I'm just present. There's no better feeling than people like cheering for you, especially when you can help other people face their stuff and have a good time or, or get lost in the experience in the moment. That's really great to be a part of and that's what I love about performing. After shows, I like to go out in the crowd and just talk to people. I don't like sitting in the back of a green room all for the rest of the night, you know? Definitely like to interact with people and feel that love. Peace. thought about the role of a curator as being kind of like a flashlight, of kind of shining a light on an artist's career. I just finished my seventh book, Chineseness, of shining a light on the important work that they're doing. I keep exploring the same aspects of identity and culture. Shining a light on things that we haven't really been aware of before. I'm interested in society's expectations. Part of my role here is to help um, be a conduit for telling stories, but also be a, a partner in helping artists tell their stories as well. The Minnesota Museum of American Art, also known as the M, has a collection of 5,000 artworks. Everything from studio craft, which includes jewelry, glass, ceramic, and wood, to fine art. Of the 5,000 artworks, many of them are by some of St. Paul's most well-known artists. Artists such as Paul Manship, Cam Booth, Claire Mars, and Francis Cranmer-Greenman. 
Paul Manship went to school at our forerunner institution and really made a name for himself as perhaps the leading American sculptor of the early 20th century. Cameron Booth led the St. Paul School of Art. He was also a very renowned painter interested in the sights and sounds of Minnesota, but also developing the new tenets of abstraction. Right, some of them are sketches or... Clara Mars was a painter, a printmaker, and a decorative artist. She was a student at the St. Paul School of Art. Later, she taught there. She began as a naturalist painter, but she moved to modernism. Her forms were flat, and she used line and color very expressively. One of Clara Marr's friends was Francis Kramer Greenman, a very important portraitist. Her portraits had a lot of vigor and dynamism, and she did come to the conclusion that what she really liked was to paint the worldly wise, as she put it, or the sophisticated. BM's known for collecting works by national artists such as Juan Chavez, Liat Yosefer, Helen Lee, but we're also known for supporting and collecting work by local artists such as Stuart Nielsen and Hazel Belvo. Nice painting. Yeah. We have a few of these in the collection. Um, of course. Of Joan Brown's, yeah. yeah. Studio work, I, you basically face a blank piece of paper or a blank wall and you have to invent a problem and then come up with a solution. Just a killer piece. It's... Yeah, I think that the brushwork is amazing in this green. My work has generally been abstract. I'm very interested in the formal language of painting. Line shape, color space, texture. Even though it's two dimensions and you've got red, yellow, and blue to work with, I think the possibilities are infinite. George took me to see this tree in 1961. Mm -hmm. And ever since then, I've been drawing it, painting right. it. The gifts to the tree are tobacco and vermilion. Your work is represented in this piece too, right? Yes. Frank Big Bear incorporated that in his work. Hazel has a lot of wisdom and stories to tell, not just about her work, but other artists who live here in the state and the work of her husband, George Morrison. When people knew that George was working in wood like this, sometimes he would get these unusual shaped packages in the mail <laughs> yeah. that people would be traveling yeah. all around the world yeah. and send him wood. The end works with artists in many ways. Everything from collecting their artwork to working on brand new commissions. Artists like Javier Tavera, we commissioned to do a brand new series of photographs. Since I arrived to this country in 96, I almost immediately turned my lens and my camera to the Latino community that is here and probably shed some light onto their stories. More than a photographer, I think I'm a storyteller and with those images, I try to tell the stories that are important for the Latino community and for me too. Uh, as well as when the, that as a museum of American art in the 21st century, we're constantly asking ourselves, what does each of those words mean? What is a museum? What is American art? What is a museum of American art? It gives us a lot of latitude to, to scrutinize what we're doing. It also gives us a chance to invite other people to help us answer those questions. One of the first exhibitions that I worked on here at the M was called American Art, It's Complicated. Our guest curators, including Tina Tavera, thought very carefully about what are the complications of American identity, American history, and American landscape. I wanted to combine artists that I felt were not receiving sufficient attention to their artwork. Some of them spoke about their own communities, like Vincent Valdez is talking about the lynchings of Latinos in Texas and in the United States. But some of them even cross boundaries to talk about someone else's community, which, I mean, these are stories that are often not heard and unknown. Yeah, this was uh, a Chinese settlement west of Sacramento. Okay. Wing Young Huey is a photographer and activist who's thought very long and carefully about what it means to be an American artist. I have photographed thousands of strangers and often get their story. And they said, well, you should meet Ping Lee. He's like the unofficial mayor. Is that right? And this is the classroom where he went to school. And the exact same chair he sat in wow. as a kid. Wow. Some of the questions I explore are, when is identity personal? 
cultural, political? When is it authentic? And when is it appreciated? You add ness to a noun, it changes it into an abstract noun. That is how I think about identity. I'm excited for this museum that is on the one hand very, very old, and on the other hand brand spanking new. And that's that very unique opportunity for a museum to have because we have so many people who know us who have been fans of the museum for so long, including artworks that are in the collection. And there's a whole brand new audience out there that hasn't met us before, that doesn't know the work that we're doing. I'm excited for the, the collection to grow and to be more representative of the diverse communities of America. And I'm excited for this to be a platform for all kinds of topics as they relate to telling stories of American artists and, and who we are as Americans. Home is the lives that influenced me. Home is like all the places that made me who I am. Home is Rondo. We are in the heart of Rondo, and this is where I'm from. The Rondo neighborhood was the first and original black neighborhood of St. Paul. It's, it's something to be said how these neighborhoods still stand, no matter how many times it has been gentrified or people have come through and destroyed our neighborhoods. We, we have not gone anywhere. This is the house. This is where my mother grew up. This is my grandmother's house. Everything I learned about womanhood and life happened on this porch. Like, I can still see my grandmother open up the door and tell people to get off her grass. That's why I'm not even standing on the grass right now. She would open the doors and be that grandma. <laughs> you know, Rondo is a culture of people. It's alive through my art, it's alive through me. It's alive through anybody that's from here. I am writing a symphony for my mother and, and to honor Rondo. And it's about home and what home means to us. It encompasses Rondo through what my mom was, because like so much of her is rooted in that neighborhood for me, and so much of her is a part of that, and so it's all one and the same to me. Oh my gosh, Bobby. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Oh, good. Um, your mom was one of the most beautiful people I have met. Just everything about your mom just makes me light. She was just really, really modest and humble with all of the talents and skills that she had. Mm -hmm. The fact that she was a gardener and she was a musical genius. <laughs> and that voice, oh my gosh. That was one of the most distinct yeah. things about her. her I, that's one thing I can't ever forget well, yeah. is the tone. Yeah. It was just a sweet tone. It was like calming and it just, it was musical. Oh man. I was, that's what I really remember the uh -huh. most. Her, and that in her eyes, you know, yeah. And you got them both. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you definitely got them both. Thank you. I've written a symphony. It's called A Requiem for Zula. I will be presenting this in collaboration with the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra and also the American Composer Forum. This will be my first time performing on this stage. And I think the coolest thing of all is it's my own music. Good to see you. Good to see you. How are you oh doing? Oh my gosh, I'm good. Can I introduce you to Pavel? Friend? Hi, yeah. nice, uh, to nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. What a pleasure. Nice to meet you. Hey, James. Nice to meet Thanks. you. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Well, Thank we're excited you. to hear your piece. Yes. yes. Yeah. Thank you for being willing and like, cause I'm, this is new territory for me. So I really appreciate being able to do this with you and embark on this journey. And you know, it helps us too. Yeah. Oh, so. Actually, it's just good exciting. Yeah, like most of us moved here, not growing up here. I mean, yeah. you grew up here, but a lot of people didn't even know about what had happened in the Rondo. Yeah, with Rondo there. and everything, yeah. yeah. Oh. I mean, my mom would love y'all and be just, just would just make her so proud. And I just oh. think that, yeah. <laughs> this is what we're supposed to be doing. I think it's kismet yeah. and I think it's meant to be. It's so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's right. And it's about time. Oh, yeah. Say that again, sis. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Oh, yeah.
Javier actually came to us and said, I'd love to work with you, I'd love to be at the Ordway. And we were really inspired by her story and just felt there was a real excitement and magnetism in, in what she had to say. Oh, I miss you, Mama. Ooh, yeah. I'm looking at it like this is Pabio does classical. <laughs> this is Pabio's Messiah. You know what I mean? This is a real kid from the block that gets to tell her story. Look how beautiful that is. Look, and it says like, you know, that's like usually you see stuff and it'd be like, Amadeus Mozart. <laughs> it says Poppy over. It's like, that's a trip. <laughs> <laughs> totally get it. Like, this is such a dream. It's like having a second uh, memorial for my mom again, but this time it's like on my terms and it's happy. I'm with you, always remember Into the truth, just surrender For I had to birth a new life this piece just, it, it's bigger than me breaking the glass ceiling and getting into the classical world. I think it's also a testament to how you can deal with trauma and stay on your feet. Everybody has that one person who loved on them in a way that broke through and you lose that person. People understand whether it's death or that person's just gone. Like people understand that and that's what this is about. Mama. Mom found out she got cancer in September 2009. And, you know, I stayed right with her to her last day. You know, after that, I just, I really felt like I didn't have a life to live anymore and I didn't really want to. And so like, I found myself through these past eight years, it has taken this long for me to come back to the person that I once knew. <laughs> Hi. Bye. How you? Good. How you? We haven't been here since mom's memorial. That's the last time we sat right up in those front pews. Yeah. Mom loved us so much. We were her life. She would tell me all the time, you can do anything you want in this world because that is the truth. And we're living it. And we're living it. And she living, she living through us. Oh yeah. She's still here. We are at the Orway, and it is opening night for my symphony, A Requiem for Zula. I just hope that tonight honors my mom in a way where people really conjure her spirit and think about her and, you know, keep her memory alive. I'm excited, like, beyond. But there's that one missing link. I've been kind of sad that she won't be there. Because I keep thinking, like, she should be in the front row. That's the, the trip of it all. Um, everything is right, except for that one thing. It seems we've come to the end. It's been truly bittersweet, my friend. But I'm blessed to honor this woman to whom so much she meant. That's the point of why I'm doing this piece, is to give the lessons that my mom gave me, the lessons that life taught me, Rondo taught me, is to give that back in a way in which that can help heal others. I believe in that alchemy stuff. I believe in that, you know, taking your pain and doing something 
positive with it. I ain't gonna let it hurt me. This program is made possible by the state's Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota.